Well, good morning again. Uh, glad that you are here. We are obviously taking a break of our series going through Matthew, and we are going to take a uh, kind of two-week here look at the call of Abram. Okay, this week I'm looking at the beginning of this call, when the call of from, comes from God to Abram. And next week, Pastor Ben from Menominee will actually be here talking about the fulfillment of that call. So starting right in Genesis 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram. So Jason already read our passage, and it's a familiar one, where we see the call of God come from God to Abram. So we start here with, here is what God said. It says, here's what God said, and pay careful attention as I read what God said, and see if it sounds familiar to you. And not because Jason read it like 15 minutes ago but because this is the same call that has gone through and echoed through Christian history to anyone who would enter into a life of faith seeking to obey God's will. It's the same call that we see recorded in Scripture, and it's the same call that you have likely received yourself. And if you haven't, then for the next 45 minutes or so, here it is. Here it is. So what is this call? It says, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. So it says, get out of your land, leave your home, leave your family, and go where I tell you. Leave all that you've known, all that you've trusted in, all that you've been counting on for the rest of your life up until this point, all that you have used to make yourself comfortable, leave all that and go where I tell you. Stop working to fulfill your own will, and start working to fulfill mine. Stop living for your own purposes and start living for mine. Work to fulfill my will, not your own. No longer do you go where you please, when you please, but you're going to go where I tell you, when I tell you. That's the call that Abram receives. Okay, just to clear things up, in case case we slip up along the way, Abram will in future chapters, have his name changed to Abraham. This is the same guy, just to clarify this for you, because I can, without a doubt, say that at some point we'll get this mixed up. But Abram here gets this call from God to leave everything behind. And this is a terrifying call. Terrifying. If this doesn't sound terrifying to you, then I don't think you understand the call that God has for you. To leave everything that you've known everything that is yours, everything that you've clung to up until this point, everything that you fought for, and instead to seek him. To cling to him. And to fight for him. This is a terrifying call to abandon all that is yours and to seek God. And yet that's the call of God. It was the call that Abram received. In Joshua 24, verse 2, it says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates. Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. So God found Abram busy about his own life, busy, far from God's will, actually serving other gods with false idols. So he's living an ungodly life for his own pursuit and his own purposes. And his call was, leave that behind and seek after the will that I have for you. Leave everything that you've known and seek after something new. And that's the same call that any individual who has found themselves in the will of God, answering the call of God, has received. Just a few chapters earlier than this, we saw that in the life of Noah. Okay, We can't say for sure, but it's widely believed that Noah was a farmer before he built an ark. And um, although we can't say for sure, I can, uh, with a greater degree of confidence, say that he probably wasn't a boat builder. And if he was a boat builder, very unlikely that he spent time, you know, building arcs for some super storms that were going to occur decades in the future. Okay, this isn't what he did. Yeah, God comes and he says, stop growing your crops. Stop worrying about that. Stop trusting in the crops that you grow to eat. And instead, you're going to find your security in obedience to me. You're going to go build a boat now. Leave what you were doing. I have something new for you. Think of Moses. Later on, once we get to the book of Exodus, after he fled Egypt, he goes to Midian, and then think of the time after he's met Jethro and he's been married, he's comfortable. 
He's got a decent life. He's married. Everything is going well. And the Bible says that as he tended the flock, so he's taking care of the sheep, at that point, God interrupted him. At that point, God said, okay, I've got something for you to do. Remember Egypt? Back where you were, we remember both the Egyptians and the Jews. Uh, they weren't too happy with Moses at this point. Remember those guys? You need to go back there. I know you're comfortable. I know things are working out for you right now, but you need to go where I tell you. Then think of the disciples, New Testament. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they were all fishermen. They all had business. They had fishing gear. They had boats. And I bet they were good at it. And then Jesus comes along and he says, stop fishing for fish. Stop fishing for food. Stop fishing to take care of yourself. Instead, come and fish for men and I will take care of you. They were busy. They had a plan. God interrupted and said, come, I have something else for you now. Think about Paul. Paul was comfortably established in the religious elite. Okay, he was comfortable where he was. People respected him. And then God comes, and not only does he say, I have something else for you to do, he calls Paul to do a complete 180. He says, remember those people that you were trying to stop? Those people that you were working so hard to try to kill? Yeah, those are good guys. You should go be a part of them. And if that's not enough, think of Jesus himself. Jesus is in heaven. It's perfect. Everything is going good for him. And then the time comes, the call of God comes, so to speak, and says, it's time. It's time for you to go to earth. That's the call of God. That's how God works. He, he finds people who are seeking their own plans, seeking their own desires, and he says, enough of that. Enough of living for your own pursuits. Enough of your own will. I have something for you. I have something for you. That's how it was for Abram, the father and founder of faith, and that is how it is for any of you who would like to Live a life obedient to answering the call of God. Anyone who's going to enter into a life of faith will start there. And here's the thing. The response to such a call, so the response when God's call comes like that, um, I'm sure is as varied as there are individuals who have received that call. But by and large, it fits into kind of three main categories. Three main categories. Category number one is outright denial. Outright denial. So these are the people who the call of God comes, they hear what God has to say, it's presented to them, the truth is revealed, and we just say no. No, God, I, I don't think that sounds very good. No, I have this figured out on my own. No, God of the universe, you know, creator of all, all powerful. I'm going to do this my own way. I think things are working out for me pretty good as they are, and if they're not, I think I can figure it out far better than I could if you were to step in. Now, this response many times works itself out in those who would act, like, actively deny the existence of God. This response many times is seen in those who actively deny that God exists. But also, many times it doesn't. It also happens in those who would deny God the ability to exercise the authority that he possesses. Who says, you know, God, uh, I, I believe you're there. I just don't really think I need you. I can do this on my own. So that's category number one, those who outright deny it. But I bet if you're here, I bet if you're sitting in the church pew on Sunday morning, category number one probably isn't you. In fact, if that is the category you're in, I'd question why you wasted your time to come here today. But category number two I believe encompasses the vast majority of those who profess to be Christians. And this category also ultimately will fail to fulfill the will of God. They will fail to actually answer his call when it comes. Category number two are those who are content to compromise. The call of God comes, the truth is presented, and they're content to compromise. So the call of God comes and they say, you know, this sounds really good. Sign me up, right? This sounds good. Sign me up. I'm all in. But then when, it times come, when the time comes to actually fulfill what it is that God's call entails, they won't ever actually do it. They won't ever actually do it. Because although they pay lip service to the calling of God, and they may even 
spend time on Wednesday nights in their small groups that they're a part of talking about finding out what God's will is and doing God's will, and they talk about what keeps them from doing God's will, but they never actually do it. They'll never actually answer the call. Because all the while, when they're trying to look spiritual like they're doing this and they signed up for it, they are clinging in desperation, sometimes secretly, sometimes not so secretly, to their own will, to their own desires, to their own plans. They're unwilling to let go of that to actually go where God's calling would lead. And I'll tell you that as a pastor, as someone who has seen this time after time, there's very few things that are more disgusting than someone who's trying to play that game. Someone who's trying to say, I want the will of God, I'm listening to the call of God, trying to half-heartedly answer the call of God, when all the while, they're really not. They're really seeking after their own will. They've made a calling for themselves, and they're unwilling to let go of that calling in order to answer the call of God with complete commitment. They're content to compromise. And just so you know, instead of that leading to the best of both worlds, which is what I think we're hoping for, like, okay, I'm going to be in God's will, and it's going to be great, and he's going to bless me, and I'm also going to be able to chase after everything I've always wanted, instead of getting the best of both, I'll tell you, you end up with the worst of both. Okay? You don't get any joy and blessing from being in God's will, nor do you give yourself full, so fully to your own will that you'll ever really accomplish anything. So you're content to compromise, and you receive nothing. And all the while, when we see those people who are playing that game, I want to cry out like Elijah did, 1 Kings chapter 18. He says, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. How long are you going to go back and forth? How long are you going to pretend that you can have both ways? If God is God, follow him. If not, then stop pretending to. The Bible says that we're either for Christ or against him. We are either doing his will or we're not. Okay, there's no gray area there. You're either answering the call of God or it's going unanswered. Think about this for Abram. For Abram here, uh, to go to where God had called him to, to get there, will take uh, about a 700-mile journey. They have about 700 miles to go. Um, over here is the land of Ur. That's where Abram was from. Over here is Canaan. About 720 miles between them. You know what? He couldn't be in both places at once. So, you know, some places, like at some times you could actually be in two places at once. Head out over here, start walking across the Bong Bridge over to Wisconsin. At some point, your back foot will be in Minnesota. Your front foot will be in Wisconsin. You're in two places at once. That doesn't work when you're going 700 miles. Okay, he can't be in Ur and Canaan, 700 miles apart. I looked it up just to see, you know, if this was possible, but it turns out that the tallest person to ever exist wasn't quite 700 miles tall. We got, he was like nine foot, okay? So there's no way, I don't care how far you stretch your legs, you're not going to be in Ur and Canaan at the same time. It just doesn't work that way. He had either left his land or he hadn't. He was either where God told him to be or he wasn't. He had either left his family or he didn't. He had to choose to either obey God or not. So what could this compromise look like for us? This category number two, those who are content to compromise, what could it look like for you and I? Well, here's one example. Could like, like those who claim to have received the call from God to be a part of this church, to be a part of this fellowship, to love these people, to serve God's kingdom and God's purposes in and through this specific local body. Many people have said that over the years. The call of God has called them here. And yet, they will never actually let go of the things that are keeping them from fully committing to that call. Those things always prevent them from fully answering the call that they supposedly say that they got from God. Career always gets priority, a relationship that pulls you away and distracts you from 
the purposes of God gets priority. These compromises prevent us from answering the call in totality. And here's the thing. Don't say that you're committed to the call of God if you're unwilling to let go of those things. Don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to yourself and say, I'm in the will of God, I'm committed to his call, but I'm unwilling to let go of this one thing, whatever it is. I don't care what it is. Don't lie to yourself. We cling to a job, we cling to a relationship, unwilling to let go. Sometimes we cling to our own self-image. We don't want to let go of that. We don't want to look like an idiot. Whatever it is, category number two are those who are content to compromise, who are unwilling to let go of those things that keep us compromising rather than committed. You cannot be in God's will and your own. It can't happen. Pick one. Pick one. And if it's God's call you're going to answer, then let nothing get in the way from you answering that call in totality. Let nothing lead you away from it. So that's number one and two. And again, there's, there's so many responses, but if we're just going to make this as basic as we can, category number three are those who actually do it. The call of God comes and it's answered. Call of God comes and it answers. And it's answered. And that answer goes beyond any kind of just simple verbal assent or mental assent with like, yeah, I'm going to do this. That sounds great. No, it actually goes to our actions. We actually answer the call. It might look something like this. God, that sounds terrifying. The call of God comes and you say, God, that, that kind of freaks me out. If I'm honest, I'd really rather not. I'd rather not do it. But God, if this is what you are calling to me to, if this is what you want from me, I'm all in. And I'm going to let nothing get in the way. And God, I pray that you'll be with me because I certainly don't want to try and do this on my own. I certainly don't want to try and answer the call of God on my own. So the call of God comes to Abram, but before it's really time for him to make a decision, before he has to answer that call, God continues on and says in verse 2, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all families of the earth will be blessed. So here are these seven great promises from God. Seven separate promises from God, great blessings. So God says, yeah, I'm asking you to do this. I'm asking you to leave all that you know, all that makes you comfortable. I'm telling you to leave that behind, but you're not going alone. I'm going to be involved. I'll be there with you. And there are all kinds of beautiful truth here in these promises. Um, there's actually a whole series that just take one of these promises for each sermon uh, we're not going to do that. So there's, there's great truths here of God's blessing, his provision, his protection. Um, there's also the promise of the coming of Christ, and that is how all the families of the earth will be blessed. It's through Jesus, Abram's far-off descendant. So there's all kinds of beautiful things here. But ultimately, um, when you read that, the only thing I'm trying to get out of here is, well, this will be awesome. This is going to be great. God's involved. So for you and I, I can't tell you what's going to happen. I have no idea if you answer the call of God and you say, yes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to give up whatever it takes in order to fulfill this call, to answer your call. I don't know what's coming. I don't know what, what's in your future. I don't. But I can say that God will be involved. I can say that he will bless you. Luke eleven twenty eight. 28 Jesus says, but even more blessed are those who hear the word of God. Sorry, I missed a word. I want to add this word because it's an important one. But even more blessed are all who hear the word of God. Just in case you thought this didn't include you and I. All, all of us, even more blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. So Jesus says, you will be blessed if you hear God's call and you do it. Now, how? No idea. No idea. And just a little warning to you. Um, in Matthew, I believe it's chapter 5, verse 10, Jesus says that you're actually blessed when you get persecution. 
So is that the blessing that we're talking about? It could be. I have no idea. But I will say that God will be involved and that you will be in his presence. Is that blessing enough? Should be. I don't know the blessing that you're promised. I know, you know, big picture, far out there. But in this life, I don't know what's coming. But is the closeness to God, is that blessing enough? It should be. So here God presents the call. And you know, I, I said that God asked Abram. Like God asked him to go. He didn't. No, he said, get out of your country. Not, please, if you would like to, you can leave. Okay, so God didn't ask Abram if he wanted this. God just said, go and do this. It was a command. It was a command. My point here is this. Answering the call of God isn't really an option for the Christian. It's not like we can pick it up if we want to. You know, you look at caller ID and God's calling again. It's like, I, I'm going to let this one go. No, for the Christian, it's a command. We do it. We either answer the call of God or we rebel against God. Okay, that's it. You're either answering his call or you're rebelling against him. God commands it. But then he says, and here's what I will do. God commands, go, leave everything that you know, leave your family, leave your house, leave your home. But then he says, and here is what I will do. So that means that now it's decision time. Now it's decision time. At this turning point, Abram has to decide, am I going to do as God commanded me or am I not? And ultimately, this is a decision, this is a turning point that every Christian will get to. The call of God comes, and you have to decide, am I going to do this or am I not? Am I going to believe God in faith, or am I going to not believe God in unbelief and disobedience? And ultimately, I think that's the decision that's being made here. Not, should I go and do this or should I not? But do I believe God or do I not? Do I believe God or do I not? Because here's the thing. If he believes God in verses 2 and 3, if he actually believes what God says in verses 2 and 3, he's going to obey what God says in verse 1. If Abram believes 2 and 3, he'll do what God says in verse 1. So do you take God at his word? Do you believe him and then obey or do you hear it and then say, yeah, I'd rather not? Yeah, I don't really think I can trust you, God. Do you believe God when he says in Matthew 6.33 to seek first the kingdom of God and his purposes, his righteousness, and then all things will be added to you? Because if so, then you'll do what he says quickly, completely, and without complaining. Do you believe God when he says that your satisfaction will be found in a right relationship with him? Because if you do, then when the call of God comes and it's going to cost you the relationships around you, it's no problem. No problem. Because you believe what God said. So ultimately, this issue of obedience comes down to an issue of belief. Answering the call of God comes to a belief issue. Do I actually have faith in God? Do I really believe him? So it's decision time. Do you take God at his word or do you not? Verse 4, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. So he took him at his word. He departed. Good. He answered the call. And Lot went with him. Wait a second. You guys remember back in verse 1? It says, get out of your country from your family. And here is his nephew Lot's with them. What's up with that? What's up with that? Well, I will say people are divided on this. There are many people who would say, oh, Abram wasn't in the wrong here because, you know, Abram was supposed to have many children, so obviously he was supposed to take his wife with him, so why not maybe his nephew as well? Um, and they also point out that it says that Lot went with him. Well, Lot was an adult. You know, Abram can't, like, tie him up to a tree and keep him from following. Well, maybe he could have. Um, so that could be the case, but I would lean towards the fact that here was actually Abram content to compromise where he's going to go where God told him to go, but he was going to try and do it the way that he wanted. And that's kind of a wide-held belief, and that comes from looking at Lot. If you're familiar with the rest of the story, Lot does not turn out to be a blessing to Abram. 
K, the, the joke, like, like as you're studying for this, you can't go by uh, anyone's writing without them including this, is that lot just brought a lot of problems, and everyone thinks they're really clever when they say that, but it's true. He brought incredible inconvenience. He brought incredible difficulty. He wasn't a blessing to Abram. So here he was. God just made these great promises, and he says, you know, I'll go where you told me to go. I almost believe you, but I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going I'm to take a little bit of what you told me not to do. And how often is this you and I? Where we obey God, like 95%, but there's like 5% where we're just not quite willing to give that up. We're not quite willing to obey to the degree that God commands. And again, you read through Genesis, you'll see that um, it did lead to some problems. But nonetheless, Abram did go where God had commanded. He did. And he should get credit for that. Notice that God only said, leave your country. Leave what you knew. Go to the land that I will show you. So he doesn't even say, this is the land that I have for you. This is what you can expect. He just says, leave. So he gets this first step. Verse 5, Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, and his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were there in the land. So here, Abram, 75 years old, it says, he takes his wife, he takes his nephew, he takes everything that they own, pack it up, and they head out. Head out to where God had told them to go. To go to the land of Canaan, Shechem, in particular. Now, there's two things to note here. One, Abram's age, he's 75 years old. And two, he goes to the land that God had for him, and guess what? The Canaanites are there. The Canaanites were there. It's already occupied. So he's 75 years old, and the land that is supposedly his is already inhabited. So why do I bring that up? Because if I'm Abram at this point, I'm confused. I'm frustrated. I'm likely doubting, perplexed, wondering what's going on. God, you said you're going to make me a great nation. I'm 75 years old, and I still don't have any kids. And I know that at that time, like, Abram's going to get to be older than any of us are going to get. But even he considered himself old. I know that because Scripture reveals that. He believed that this didn't make sense. At this time, uh, his wife, Sarai, is 65 years old, so she's not far behind. She's not far behind. If I'm him, I'm confused. 75 years old with no children, so how is this going to work? God, you said this land was mine, but evidently it's not because there's these Canaanite guys and they seem to think that it's theirs. Okay, God, is this really a good idea? You're making these amazing promises to me about being a great nation. These promises that you're making to me mainly have to do with children and land. And we're, we're having a problem with both. No children and the land's not really mine. One pastor said this, you know, there's people in the land, so here's the problems. There's people in the land, and there's no people in Sarai. Okay, so that's the problems. That's what doesn't seem to make sense. But God chose to work through a couple who had no earthly potential to accomplish the very thing he most wanted to accomplish. So think about that. A central part of this promise, central part of what I'm going to do for you, is to have children. And in order to accomplish that end, I'm going to pick this couple in their older years who are past where they would think that they would have children and who have been unsuccessful in having children at this point, and the land that I'm going to hand to you is already held by someone else. So God's calling for you doesn't always make sense. Okay? Sometimes God's going to call you to something and you're going to say, I don't understand how this could be. That's how I feel standing right here in front of you right now. God, why would you put me up here? I don't know, but he did. So sometimes his calling doesn't make sense. And if you're going to limit yourself to the understanding of God's calling for your life, to the worldly wisdom that you have, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to miss out. Because God's calling requires God's involvement. That's why we need him. That's why when you answer that call, you and I get very little credit for it. 
okay? Like no one after Abram and Sarah had kids at an older age, you know, looking in the future. No one's like, wow, you, like, you guys did a really good job to be able to pull that off. No, God gets the credit. No, God gets the credit. So I'm sure at this point, Abram's mind is spinning. Uh, you know, worldly wisdom of, was of little use to him, especially because he didn't even know where he was going. Remember, he didn't know what was going on. This didn't make sense. Okay, I'll, I'll go. But many times, that's how the call of God works. He calls you to a particular step. Many times, he only reveals the first step. And as you find that you obey in that calling, the second call comes. Further direction is given. It's the principle of Luke 16.10 put into practice. If you're faithful in the little things, you'll be given more. Well, are you going to leave your land? Or are you not? He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know how he was going to get there. God just said, go and I'll tell you on your way. That's how God likes to do things. Verse 7, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So Abram obeys, goes where God tells him to do, and notice what happens right away. God then appeared to him. Now before this, it says that the word of God came to him, but it doesn't say that God appeared to him. So in Abram's obedience, now he's experiencing the presence of God in a more real way than he ever has. God appeared to him. We don't have the details. I don't know what that looked like. No clue. But God appeared to him, spoke to him. It told Abram that this land would belong to his descendants. Remember that. Verse 7, God says, this land is yours. It says, And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him, and he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. So what is he doing now? He's building altars to worship the Lord. He's building altars to worship the Lord, to call on the name of the Lord. And I bring that up because I don't want us to get so lost in finding our calling, in doing what we're supposed to do, in obeying when God tells us to, that we forget why we're doing it. We're so concerned with obeying God, but we don't even remember who God is. Because that can be a danger for you and I. We're a busy church. We do a lot. Do you remember why? Okay, you're answering the call. You know, the church puts out a call for volunteers and you, you show up. Yeah, why? Why? Are you worshiping God? Do you love God? Do you remember him in this calling? Or are you just busy? Abram wasn't just busy. He did what God told him to do, and then he worshiped him. Then he called on his name. Never forget why it is that you're doing what you're doing when you're answering the call of God. Don't forget why. I don't want to build in us just people who are going to be really diehard about doing all the right stuff and they forget why. And there's no love there. That shouldn't be the case. Now up to this point, you might think, okay, this is all well and good. I think I've been answering that call. I'm doing okay. This is working out. But here's the thing. Okay, that might be true, but what about tomorrow? Because tomorrow's coming. And maybe tomorrow goes good because you like Mondays, but what about Tuesdays? Let's read in verse 10, and I'll read all the way to the end of the chapter. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you, that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here's your wife. Take her and go away 
So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Now put aside the weird circumstances of Abram calling his wife his sister. Put that aside for a second. What was he doing in Egypt? Remember I said to remember, beginning of verse 7? This is the land. I'm going to give it to your descendants. This is yours. And then like three verses later, there's a famine. He's run into Egypt. God called him to Canaan. Just a mere couple verses ago, he confirmed that call. And Abram's now running to Egypt. And here's where we see Egypt start to kind of be this picture that will continue on through scripture of the world, of sin, of disobedience to God. So there was a famine. Difficulty arrived and Abram split. Difficulty came his way and he said, you know, enough of this. I'm getting out of here. So did the call of God change because of the circumstances that he was in? No. Your call, what God has for you, doesn't change because of the circumstances around you. It doesn't. I don't know about your guys' Bible, but mine says in Romans eleven twenty nine 29, that the calling of God is irrevocable. The calling of God is irrevocable. Not the calling of God stays the same as long as it's convenient, as long as you like it, and as long as it's easy. It seems like Abram, like most of us, found it easier to trust God in these far-off promises, these kind of like nebulous, far-off promises, rather than in the, like, the right now dire needs and current situation. So it's easy to trust God when you have no need of him, right? Like I can say that I trust God fully when I have no need of him. <clears throat> but what about when your back is against the wall? What about when it seems that to stay in God's will, to answer his call, is going to cost you everything? Abram probably thought it was going to cost him his life. There was a famine. It was great. I don't know if you know this, but when you don't eat, you die. So he probably thought, you know, this is serious. I need to fix this. What happened to the belief in God? What happened to the faith that said, God, you told me to be here, so I'm going to stay, come what may? Are you going to remain in that call even when it's costly? Abram thought to answer God's call would cost him his life, so he ran. So he started out well, started out well, I mean, mostly well, went to where he was supposed to be, but at the first sign of problem, it comes and he makes a run for it. Here's the thing, if we want to rebel against God's calling, we will find an excuse to do so. Okay, there's always a famine that we can point to, right? Oh, you don't, you don't get it. The perfect job came my way. Perfect guy came into my life. Perfect girl came into my life. You don't understand. I had to. Like, there was no way, no way that I could stay where you wanted me, God. Circumstances came. You don't understand. Isaiah says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots and in their great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. Woe to you when you run to the world to fix your problems. Woe to you when difficulties come and you say, I'm going to go get this fixed in the world. When you abandon your post, looking for a life of ease. A lot of people start this journey only to turn and run when it gets hard, and God knows that. That's why in the New Testament, he makes it so clear that we are to count the cost, that we are to know that this is difficult. He has so many warnings to us, so many warnings. And uh, the sad thing is, it almost seems like they're a waste of time. Because I've been doing this long enough now to see that no matter how many warnings you get, it seems like once, it's not until you're actually in that difficult time that it, it becomes real. So he warns us time and time again that it's going to be hard. But what I've seen is that um, eventually people's trust in God is going to crumble when it gets too hard for them. Not everyone, but many times that's what happens. But if your trust in God crumbles when it's tested, that's not real faith. There's no real faith in that. To entrust in Jesus means to trust him come whatever may. That's real faith. The testing of our faith, and that's what this was, the testing of our faith shows the validity of our faith. 1 Peter 1.7 says, These trials will show that your faith is genuine. 
It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. These trials that you're in will show that your faith is genuine. So many times God allows these trials in our life, these difficulties, the famines to come for us to see, are we really where we think we are? Are we really trusting God? Is our faith Genuine. Okay, now going on to this mess with uh, Abram pretending that his wife is actually his sister. What are we going to get out of this? Um, so they go into the land of Egypt, and Abram knows that his wife is really beautiful. He says, this, this isn't going to work out very good. Um, you know, you're so beautiful that they're going to want you for themselves, so they're going to kill me. So instead, just say that you're my sister and everything will work out good. Then you'll be alive, I'll be alive. Everything will be wonderful. And that's kind of what happened. So Abram was, you know, he, he kind of understood what was going to happen to some degree because it worked out well for him. It says that the Pharaoh blessed Abram because of her sake. He had sheep, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys and camels. And uh, for many years, for many years, people would use passages like this that talked about domesticated camels to try to prove that scripture couldn't be trusted. They said that, you know, in that era, no one had domesticated camels, and that wasn't for many, many generations later. But after years of further research, further discovery, turns out that they're wrong. Turns out that there is actually great evidence that camels were domesticated, but only by those who were, you know, like super rich and wealthy enough to actually do it. So further research proves that. And I bring that up just to say when, it, when we see this list, it's indicating great wealth. To include camels in there is like saying, you know, he drove a Ferrari, whatever luxury car you want to include. He had camels. But then it doesn't go so well. Then God plagues Pharaoh because of the deception. And this is God keeping up with the promise that he gave back in verse 3, where he says, I will curse him who curses you. So here, people are not treating Abram and his wife the way that they should be treated, even though they didn't do it intentionally. And God is faithful to his promise. He sends plagues. And Pharaoh is not happy with the deception. What's crazy here is that the pagan king seems to be more morally sensitive than Abram. Think about it. He fears God's judgment more than Abram. Abram fears for his own life. You don't get the sense here when you read this that Abram is greatly concerned with the judgment of God. But Pharaoh is concerned with that. Pharaoh seems to respect this marital fidelity more than Abram. He doesn't want to commit adultery, and he's angry when he discovers that he almost did. So he sends him away. So what can be said of this? Like, what does this have to do with what we're talking about? Sure, there's something to be said about, like, don't deceive people. It's probably a great lesson there. But I think that's missing the point. I think... Ultimately, this brings us back to the same question we started with, is are you going to trust God? Will you trust God even when it doesn't make sense, or will you not? Will you answer the call of God even when you'd rather not, or are you going to run to Egypt and get yourself in a great mess? For me, when I read this, when I read this chapter, the first half reads a whole lot better. You know, the, the blessings and the spending time with God, worshiping God and God saying, I'm going to give you all this and this is your land and then God appearing. That sounds a whole lot better than the second half where Abram runs off and tries to do, thing on, do things on his own. First half reads a whole lot better than the second. So God is calling. The question is, are you going to get it? Are you going to get it? Are you going to actually answer it? I'm going to end with this quote from John Calvin. He says, for it is better with closed eyes and broken feet to follow God as our guide than by relying on our own providences to wander through the paths that life devises for us. In other words, it's better to go with our eyes closed and crippled feet holding the Lord's hand than to go with full function. So I'd rather have crippled feet and blind eyes following God's will, being led by him, than doing this on my own. So the question ultimately we're left with is, do you trust God or do you not? If you trust God, you are answering his call. Do you trust God or do you not? And I wouldn't bother answering, okay? 
I wouldn't bother answering because ultimately your life is answering for you. The words you say right now matter very little. If you trust God, you're answering his call and you can see that because you are not content to compromise, but instead you abandon everything he tells you to, to seek first his kingdom, his purposes. Your life will show it. Your life will show it.